Talk Nerdy is brought to you by its sponsor, AT&T, which provides IU students, faculty, and staff with personal cellular services at discounted rates. Talk Nerdy to Me, a conversation about technology's hottest topics at Indiana University and beyond. Welcome to Talk Nerdy to Me, a conversation about technology at IU and beyond. I'm your host, Janae Cummings, and with me as always are the Pikachu and Frogadier to my Ash Ketchum, Brendan Howell, and Liam Bowling. Happy Halloween, fellas. How are you doing? I hope I'm Pikachu, because obviously he was the best. <laughs> of course you are. Well of course. <laughs> doing pretty well. Yeah, pretty good. Right. Life's going on. Busy, busy as always. So. so Halloween was last night. Were you guys anything? No, I was at home. Yeah, kind of same. We're, we're pretty boring people. I don't know. Halloween <laughs> for me just not being fun when I didn't get free candy anymore. So that's really the truth. That was the only reason yeah. to go. I dressed my dog up as Spider Man, um, much to her dismay. <laughs> but that's about the. I think that's the only exciting thing that happened. So I did go to my mom's though. She was giving a candy side. Like went over there with like a little Ziploc bag and loaded up. That's so. how you have to do life. I hope <laughs> yeah. it was one of those quart or half gallon freezer bags. No, it's just a sandwich bag. I kept it modest. That's not good enough. <laughs> so before we get going with episode 21, we have a little housekeeping. This is the last Talk Nerdy for the 2015 calendar year. We're going to spend the next few weeks planning our 2016 schedule, and the first step in that process is getting feedback from all of you. So reach out to us, tell us who you are, what you're all about, and what topics you're interested in. Do you know someone who should be a guest on the program? Let us know. Is there something you'd like us to cover? Give us a shout. You can reach out to us via email at nerdy at iu.edu, on Twitter at talknerdyiu, and online at talknerdy.iu.edu. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you, and if we don't, we're going to keep talking about all the things we think are awesome. And with that, let's hit some news. The first thing I want to discuss today uh, is Microsoft finally showing the world that it is a player in the innovation game with the release of the Surface Book. It's a hybrid laptop that I don't know if it's It's not just the most exciting Windows machine to emerge in a decade. It's probably the only exciting Windows machine (laughs) to emerge in the last decade. It's beautiful. What do you guys think about it? I think the Surface itself was the most exciting Microsoft product to come in a decade. So, Fair enough. So you're like a Surface 4 kind of person as opposed to Surface Book? No, I mean, I think the Surface Book is cool, too, but it's still like from the Surface family. So I think it's like the thing that Microsoft needed to kind of pull themselves back into the game. But I really don't get the Surface Book. Really? I mean, I'm not that excited about it. It's a laptop. It. Yeah, it's a, a tablet. A, it's a laptop, <laughs> it's, but... But it's a great hybrid. Yeah. It's a great laptop. It's but a I strong tablet. But I mean, it looks tablet. like something... To me, how it like flips all the way back around and stuff, it reminds me of like the Lenovo Yoga. So yeah. Yeah, I don't... That was... Oh. I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> what's going to justify this $1,500 price. That's true. It's a little expensive, but that yeah. hinge... I mean, that's that's worth it alone. That, like, really cool kind of snake hinge. <laughs> that hinge is fantastic. The only thing that bothers me about the hinge is that there's that large gap. Yeah. That mm-hmm. really bothers yeah. the OCD part of myself, or yeah. I, it needs to lay flat. It needs yeah. to be flush for me. But I can't imagine a lot of, like, dust and grime getting in there. That can't be good. Yeah. I don't know. I think the hinge has to be like that, though, in order to it bend the way that it is. So, I mean, I think it's definitely a pretty book. Um, I just don't really know why it's fifteen hundred dollars. And I know like the MacBook Pros cost that much, and at the, the very least. display, yeah, at least that much. But Apple's always had their prices that way. And if you compare like MacBook prices to like PC prices, there is a big difference there. And so I don't know that a lot of people are going to buy this being at the same price it is. Like, why would they just not get a Mac if they're going to spend this much money? Yeah. Because the graphics card could be better. Uh, yeah, I guess They've got the, like, a custom NVIDIA GPU mm-hmm. that um, lets you game and yeah. do any other kind of graphics. Like if you're drawing, if you, flip the, if you flip the tablet around to draw, that kind of thing, it could finally mm-hmm. handle it. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like it should be like 300 maybe $400 less. But yeah. that's just my opinion. It's interesting seeing like Microsoft move towards like the premium products mm-hmm. as opposed to you know what they were known for before with their OEMs. But I don't know. They're trying to be like the MacBook of the PCs, I guess. Yeah, like. <laughs> but it seems that I think as far as PC manu- manufacturers are concerned, this is kind mm-hmm. of a mic drop on this one. They are no oh, yeah. one else is doing something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, they've really they've really pushed the envelope in a way that these other manufacturers are going to have to catch up, and that's only a good thing. Yeah. What I do like is that it seems that Microsoft is kind of owning the whole 
like we're gonna make the software as well as the hardware thing and like Apple does basically before it was just Microsoft made Windows and they pass it out to all the other manufacturers and they kind of determine their own price um, of their computers and Microsoft was wanting to g- kind of give Windows a premium mm-hmm. I guess feel to it yeah so I think Windows 10 is definitely a significant upgrade from like Windows 8 and everything mm-hmm. um, and then the Surface was already an innovator and it was pretty and this is pretty as well so I think the Surface is doing pretty well I think it was like their last earnings they said their their sales were up significantly for yeah. it and mm-hmm. it's it's killing it I don't know I would have a Surface but I can't iMessage on it so yeah <laughs> it's kind of out <laughs> well for me when I do I do a lot of writing and so I don't find the Surface to be very convenient for that I don't like the keyboard mm-hmm. um, I need a little more power to, to produce a lot of this kind of stuff so the surface book um is exciting for me but totally specked out the price is completely outrageous yeah, it's, mm-hmm. like above and dollars. it's not worth it and i'm wondering i'm wondering about the longevity also you know i have a macbook pro which is great for a long time it does what it needs to do mm-hmm. for many years and you don't have to replace it very much whereas i think with lap with pcs um windows laptops you know they're cheap because you use them burn them out in a couple of years and you just get a new yeah. one so I don't know, maybe micro. Maybe that's why Microsoft is producing their own because they also want something that will last that mm-hmm. long. I mean, I don't have a Surface. I don't know how long they're supposed to last, but maybe the Surface Book will last the five years that a that a MacBook Pro would last. I mean, my last the MacBook Pro I had for five years, yeah, and I just got a new one this year because that one finally slowed down with all the um, OS X updates and everything. Yeah, and maybe this would kind of do the same. Fear would definitely so. be like. Because I think it was the Surface, what, 1 or 2 was pretty much the same, but then the jump to the 3 was, like, a massive difference. It was. And I fear it would be that, like, next year they're going to come out with a much better Surface book, and mm-hmm. that's, that's always the Maybe adjust technology. the price a little bit. I would <laughs> yeah. think, you know, with gaming, with this custom chip, if it's anything, I don't know, I think a lot of the Dell, the Dell Alienwares have a custom chip in them, yeah. mm-hmm. which they're not top-of-the-line chips, but they get the job done, where mm-hmm. you don't have to build your own machine. Mm-hmm. Um, this could be great for those kinds of users. For gamers um, who I'm interested to see their sales once it launches in December so yeah we'll see I still think a lot of people are gonna go to the surface 4 over the service book just because, because of, the, of the price the, the, the cheaper you know the mm-hmm. versatility of like oh it's a tablet too and because right. mm-hmm. I think the surface book you can take it out as a tablet but then it like I mean if you have the GPU and the base or whatever it degrades the performance and it's like two hours three hours of battery or something I think it's kind of do we know if they're gonna put that in the base or is it all gonna be in the main part of the, the surface which the the GPU or the battery or like all of it? Oh, I think it's like if you get the spec'd out version, mm-hmm. the they come out with like there's a GPU in the base that makes the graphics better when mm-hmm. um, it's connected to the base. But then I think the the actual tablet part of it has like an okay amount of battery life, but okay. then the majority of the battery is in the base. I mean that's kind of understandable though, because I mean if you're going to be doing something that requires that much power, like you're probably going to yeah, be sitting yeah. down with it anyway, uh, not carrying sure. it portably. That makes sense. For sure. So. I don't know. I guess only time will tell. Yeah. You say that about everything. Well, I mean, because <laughs> it's not out yet. We're talking about a lot of stuff that hasn't been released. That's so. right. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. So another uh, thing coming out of Microsoft, of course, was the updated Microsoft Band, mm-hmm. which I think um, it's finally curved, but not nearly enough. Oh, um, yeah. I wasn't. A f- I wasn't a fan of the first Microsoft Band because I think, as I've, I've noted before, it looked like a shackle. Yeah. But um, it's a curved shackle. No. Yeah. <laughs> This one I think definitely looks better. It has like a nice silver body around the screen and everything. And it kind of like seamlessly blends into the rest of the band, I think. Whereas before you knew that there was just a big like chunk yeah. of plastic and metal or and glass at the top. But I don't know, it's not curved enough to feel comfortable, I, I don't think anyway. But I mean, it's gonna read your heart rate and do other stuff like that. So you kind of need it to be snug on your arm. So it's gonna have to, to be kind of square at the same time. But I just feel like they, could do a little bit better with the design of it so and i don't think it really does much more than the previous model besides having like a couple new sensors in it and that's it yeah i think it's so. just like the addition of gps i think there's so. like gps there's like uh um, barometer and yeah. a um uv monitor so. all right <laughs> i think the gps is a pretty big deal i think it's a too, especially if you're playing like golf or running or doing something like that like that will be um useful but they also increased the price fifty dollars, and I don't know yeah. if that really justifies. $50. I'm also curious about the the quality of the band itself. I know a lot of people who run with their Microsoft band; it starts to deteriorate, de- degrade. The material is actually starting yeah. to fall apart. 
I don't, I don't know. I've never had one, so I personally can't speak to it. But I mean, like when I had my fuel band, I would work out with that all the time. So I would get on it, like everything, and it was just fine. I do the same thing with my Apple Watch, and it's still in perfect condition. So um, hopefully, Apple learned a little bit from its last model and mm-hmm. made this one a little bit better. You mean Microsoft? Yeah, Microsoft. Oops, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Brendan. We were talking about the Apple Watch. <laughs> we were talking about the Apple Watch. So before we move on to everything else, let's take a quick break and swing things over to Ross for the latest tip from the UITS Support Center. Thanks, Janae. Today we're talking about the problem with wireless. I use Secure gets a bit of vitriol once in a while, but I use Network Team as fighting a particularly complex problem. And just in case they're listening... They do a pretty darn good job. The first obstacle to good wireless coverage will be pretty intuitive for most folks, the physical coverage area. Up in space with nothing around you, a wireless access point, or WAP, will broadcast a nice round bubble of wireless signal. You'd be able to predict exactly how far the signal would reach in any direction, and you could plan the number of WAPs to cover precisely the area you need. Here on Earth, unfortunately, things are not so simple. Basically, anything that uses electricity will interfere with a wireless signal. Try putting your router under your subwoofer and see what kind of reception you get. TV, microwave, cordless phone, anything that plugs into an electrical outlet has some effect on your Wi-Fi reception. A lot of things that don't use electricity do, too. Glass window nearby. That interferes. Fluorescent lights? Interference. Metal in the ceiling? Concrete floors? Cinder blocks? Is there a circuit breaker behind that wall? All of that influences wireless coverage, and so we're left with a bubble that looks more like a misshapen amoeba. Second obstacle, concurrent users. Physics sets a limit on the maximum number of devices that can connect to a single access point at one time. On enterprise level of equipment, this limit is somewhere around 80 people. Think about how often you're in the same area as 80 other people on campus. Just pretty much always. We fight this by layering WAPs on top of each other But to do that, we have to adjust the frequency they communicate on, and the FCC limits which frequencies you can use. So if we need 160 people connected in the same area, we put one on the highest permissible frequency and one on the lowest, and that works pretty well. If we need 240 people in the same area, we put a third WAP with a frequency halfway between those extremes, but that starts to cause interference. The closer your frequencies are, the more likely they are to muck with each other. Interference means we have to move those access points closer together to maintain the same signal strength. Past four, maybe five access points in the same area, it becomes an incredibly difficult game to fine-tune location and broadcast strength to keep each unit usable while maintaining that same physical coverage area. Another limit, address space. This one is actually well within our control. Back when I lived in the dorms, IU had less than one internet-enabled device on campus per person. Today that trend has dramatically flipped and almost everyone walking around is responsible for multiple internet enabled devices. That smartphone in your pocket is one, your laptop is two, maybe your Xbox or VoIP phone in your room is three and four, and you get the idea. Each of those devices requires a numerical address to communicate over any network. During move-in this year, we ran out of those addresses on IU Secure. We were able to shuffle some in from other networks, but we have a finite number to work with. We got caught without enough addresses because we simply could not predict the dramatic upshot in the number of devices connected on campus this fall. There's no survey where we ask how many devices you'd like to bring. We work with trends and educated guesswork. This problem could easily repeat itself in the spring semester or maybe next year. We just don't know. And finally, consider how often the campus environment changes. New windows in Eigenman? That affected wireless coverage. New International Studies building in the Arboretum? That affected wireless coverage. Even simple things like somebody bringing a new microwave into the break room could ruin wireless reception for dozens of people, and our network folks would have no idea. A human with a signal meter has to go out there and find the problem. Luckily for us, you are all humans with signal meters. If you notice an area that regularly has one or no bars of IU Secure Signal, report it to us. Visit one.iu.edu and search for wireless. You'll find a form you can use to report coverage and signal strength problems. 
For other problems with networking, of course, we'd love to talk with you at the Support Center, ithelp at iu.edu, and more contact info available online. Now, if she's still connected, back to Janae. Much appreciated, Ross. Good stuff as always. So in February, I don't know if you all remember, but Anthem, which is the second largest health insurer in the United States, reported a breach that compromised the personal data of up to 80 million people. Um, Needless to say, this was one of the largest hacks in corporate history, and signs pointed to, at the time, involvement by entities sponsored by the Chinese government. But like all news about hacks, you know, there was furor and outrage for a week or two. We all got letters letting us know that that our data had been stolen, Mm -hmm. and it kind of died down. And then now, probably a week or so ago, we've learned that the allegations against the Chinese were true, which I guess is probably not a big surprise. But what is a surprise is why Anthem was targeted, and that's that Beijing is trying to figure out how to provide health care for its aging population and wants to learn how the U.S. approaches medical coverage. That's kind of shocking. <laughs> I think it's kind of cool that we're kind of the role model for that, um, especially when people, a lot of people complain about health care in the U.S. compared to other countries. Um, but, yeah, it did reach a lot of people. I mean, there were a couple other, like, health related mm-hmm. breaches that happened in 2010 and 2013 and stuff um, and so it was kind of nice to find out who was really behind that and why is even better so I think my first question is why couldn't they just ask yeah that I, did they even like make an attempt to reach out to them these aren't say, state you know? secrets yeah this yeah. isn't nuclear power this is healthcare mm-hmm. and intellectual property and related to healthcare I don't know. Maybe it was a pride thing. Maybe they wouldn't didn't want to seem like a weakling in one right. area. I mean, China right. is a big dog. You could so. shoot them an email or just send an entire team to hack them. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the latter is what they chose. Yeah. So, I think be, I think China has they've had exponential growth in healthcare. I think ninety five percent of their population is now covered. Um, why? The United States, instead of France or Switzerland or Norway or any other country that does health care better than we do. Yeah. Is it that our security maybe is more lax? Is it scale? I, th- I think it has to do with scale because I think there's no other country that you know has to deal with health care on the scale that we do mm-hmm. um, well, besides China. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so that might be a reason because I think a lot of the arguments of saying, oh, basing health care off of the smaller countries is that you know their population is less than like a you know eighth of ours, and how can you compare? But I I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a good question. I feel like a lot of it has to do is that we are like one of the few countries that capitalizes on healthcare because mm-hmm. a lot of other countries it's like a government provided service. That's true. And the fact that they're looking at insurance companies, insurance companies are the ones that negotiate the prices that they're going to pay to hospitals and other specialists and whatnot. Right, they set and up so, the networks. Right, and so maybe they're trying to figure out how can we do that as well. Because I don't know, do they have, like, does the government of China pay for healthcare now, or do the people there pay for it? I think the government pays, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. But with the populace, I mean, it's there's so much poverty that I can't imagine mm-hmm. that you have a, really out of a lot of their population <laughs> funding the healthcare. Maybe they're trying to figure out how they can privatize it so that they can relieve some of the costs from the government. Mm-hmm. Kind of uh, comes back to why don't you just call up you know, these companies and say, hey, would you guys consult for us and kind of help us? Or is this a pride thing? I don't really... It seems that when you're dealing on a corporate level, yeah. mm-hmm. that you could you could reach out to Anthem or yeah. or these... They're not in the same United market Healthcare. at all. It's right. a different country. Right? Yeah. I don't know. And I feel like it has to do with them wanting to kind of move it from being public to private and mm-hmm. kind of figure out how they can capitalize on the healthcare cost. So, I mean, it is a very, very profitable industry. So that's, yeah. Yeah. maybe that's what they're trying to figure well, out. Well, and that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. It's just so strange. I mean, it seems that the only thing we have to offer is our own confusion <laughs> here to, <laughs> to other nations. Yeah. But I don't know. It seems, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just really bizarre, I think. At least it wasn't something malicious. So. Well, true, but there, they have so many issues. It seems, it seems to me that you would be able to, the government could reach out. Mm-hmm. We're trying to do this thing. We're trying to do this great thing for our people. Yeah. Help us out. That's a great PR move, I think, generally. People would like to hear that they're not doing something malicious this time. They just want to help their people. And It's also I a good think. way to kind of build a relationship with another country as right. well. So, yeah. I mean, we basically, we know that the China owns us. <laughs> so but this would be a chance <laughs> for us to give something back to them. So maybe that's what they didn't want. I don't know. It's yeah. true. Maybe that is what 
That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. We're probably out of our depth on this one, so <laughs> let's move on to something uh, more in our realm, which is wearable fashion. We all have smartwatches, um, which means we're all pretty supportive of wearable tech. But most people, for most of them, I think wearables are only awesome in theory. Mm -hmm. And in reality, they're not quite sure what they want their clothes to do or if their clothes should do anything, right? Um, or apart from maybe keep them protected, warm, mm -hmm. and mildly fashionable. But Adam Selman, who's a fashion designer and one of Rihanna's favorites, just took things to the next level by designing a dress with a built-in NFC chip, and he did this for MasterCard. Yeah, so him and MasterCard are kind of partnered to create wearable fashion. I don't know how far it's going to go or if it's going to take off, because, I mean, we all have the smartwatches now. We all have, like, Apple Pay or Android Pay or Samsung Pay or whatever. Um, so ha is having an NFC chip or whatever chip you need in your clothes really necessary? No. It's not. <laughs> it's not. But if you're, I think if you're a person who's going out a lot, you might appreciate it. And you want to carry less or not wear your smartwatch. And you don't want to wear your watch. Yeah. You don't want to carry a purse. You don't want to carry your phone. Mm -hmm. It could be nice to hop in a cab. And yeah. Tap your Tap your shirt. Shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Tap your... Just seems wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I want to. I just want to see like where this is going to go and if any other like fashion designers are going to adopt it. And if any other players in the finance industry like Citi or um, Visa are going to um, kind of a, partner up with someone else to create their own version of this too. So um, I don't know how many other clothes Adam has made, but there's like in the picture that we saw online, there's just that one dress. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what else he's done. And I don't even know where the, the card is hidden. They said it's in a bow, so I'm thinking it's a, the bow that's on her shirt. But um, I don't know. I really don't see much use of it. You can't share clothes anymore because you want someone to have your payment information in their <laughs> yeah. clothes. Yeah. <laughs> but if wearables, if, if wearable tech is really going to take off, you need fashion. You need the fashion design industry, I think, to lead that charge. Because they have to make it look good, or you end mm -hmm. up with Google Glass. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> but I think that's happening too with some of our like um, our wearables for like smartwatches and fitnesses and everything, or fitness and everything. But um, like with Fitbit, they partnered with I think Tory Burch to make bands for women. Mm -hmm. um, and then like with the Apple Watch, there's a lot of different manufacturers that are making a more fashionable mm -hmm. um, band for the Apple Watch. And then they partner with Hermes to kind of create a a luxury slash high-end fashion band as well. I don't think it's that pretty or that sexy. But no, it isn't, <laughs> but it is Hermes. Yeah, and it just has a name behind it. So I feel like maybe that should still kind of be fashion's um, push for wearables rather than like dresses that have NFC chips in them or um, payment chips or whatever, but I don't know. I don't know. It seems that we're moving away from swiping all the time. We want yeah. to. It's it's not secure and it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And there's just gonna be a point where I think we want to put our phones down also and yeah. yeah, be even more unencumbered. Yeah, and even now, I mean, like a lot of like I just got new cards because all mine expired at the same time this year, and they all have that new chip in them. Mm -hmm. They don't have like the contactless payment anymore because the chip is more secure. And then like even when you use like Apple Pay on my phone, it like when you look at the receipt, it has a different card number than what's actually your right. card number to kind of disguise everything to kind of a little bit more of security, so um, maybe that's the reason for, for this as well, to kind of just keep away from swiping and having contactless payment, so. One thing I do wonder, how do you get a chip in all of your clothes? I, it, I, this it, is in definitely a way, just it like is, a, It is wildly impractical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds cool, mm -hmm. and then we're back to theory, I guess. It sounds expensive, too, so. True. Yeah. yeah. I think it's kind of like a PR move, honestly. I. I don't see it going too far. I yeah, think the future is definitely you know, on the wrist, mm -hmm. wearable, pain with your wrist. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about tapping your T-shirt to a, no, a stretch. A but <laughs> well, I guess you got to try in order to fail. So You do, but yeah. I, see, I can see if they try to release this in New York and L.A. and mm -hmm. they could get, it, could, it could get a small amount of traction. It's just not so, going yeah. to. Yeah. It's not going to pass over to the flyover states, which is where we are. So yeah. that's going to be the end of it. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't really see it going that far. No. So. Speaking of not really needing your phone in some respects, smartphone sales are starting to stall worldwide. Um, we're reaching a, a saturation point. You know, you can't have growth really when we all have what we need. Mm -hmm. And um, with the emerging markets left, I mean, Ch China, China is officially being saturated now. And so all that's really left are the rest of Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. They're fast growing regions, but they're poorer regions. And they're not going to be excited about the iPhone and 
these other devices. They're, they're going for cheaper, cheaper phones. I don't know. I mean, a lot of those countries, they want the phones that we have in the U.S., yeah. but it just isn't a good business move to launch them there because mm -hmm. like, there's only a small portion of the population that's going to be able to even afford them, and then theft is probably going to rise because of all that. So I feel like that's why Apple is very strategic with where they want to launch their phones at, right. and now they just launched it in China, which did them some good. But like the other phones like uh, LG and Sony, and like they're kind of struggling. They're more popular overseas than they are here in the U.S., but the people over there also can't really afford to buy them. So right, they're right. all just struggling. Yeah. Like Apple seems like the only real winner right now in smartphone sales. They topped their Q4 estimates, mm -hmm. but everyone else is falling apart. LG, I think, or they're losing. Their mobile business just lost uh, $67 million for just this quarter alone. So Just for the quarter? I believe so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this well, I, think, I think I read that Sony is losing nearly $2 million a day. Mm -hmm. um, Samsung cut the price of the Galaxy S6 and Edge only to burn their profits, even though they increase their sales. And HTC, who is just a general loser in life, I think we can say by now, <laughs> <laughs> they will stop giving guidance at their uh, on their earning reports probably because they have no guidance to offer. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they can, I guess, predict their future anymore. I mean, usually, like at the beginning of the year, you develop like some budget or some projection of what your financials are going to be, so that way, you, when you're going through the year, you can compare your um, actual performance to your projected performance. And I don't think that they're gonna be able to do that anymore. I don't think they think that they, they can do the well. They are the ultimate sad trombone in technology. I think they are, they've had probably the worst quarter that I think anyone has ever had. I think they've had the worst last couple of years <laughs> than anyone. That's true. Yeah. That's true. They keep pushing everything to this HTC One phone, but they're not really changing much about it. And then their new interface just isn't that great either. I just don't think that they know what to do. Well, you saw the A9, the one A9, which is essentially an iPhone running Android, mm -hmm. which is a, a mess. Lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. It'll happen. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's what they're waiting for. Maybe they're just sacrificing themselves, throwing yeah. themselves up, take us out. So they can have a reason to go out instead of saying that we just sucked. Right, right. <laughs> I know. I, it's I, like some kind of weird smartphone seppuku. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, HTC is so low right now. I think Apple just doesn't really care. You know, I don't think they're going to. But, I mean, going back to like, you know, why is the iPhone doing so well in China? Why is it doing so well here? And why do these other like brands, why can't they capitalize on it? And I think it's really because everyone wants an iPhone. They don't want a no-name phone. They want the Apple brand. You know, mm -hmm. I think it was originally when Apple moved to China and, you know, started selling iPhones. Wall Street was like, hey, you know, China wants cheaper phones. And Apple's like, no, our brand is going to sell. And they were right. Um, they were right. So I think it's, it'll be interesting seeing where they go in the future, going to those other you know, markets that are not really tapped yet. No, that's fair. That's fair. Something interesting about Apple, though, and you brought up earlier um, when we were talking offline, is the bundle with the Apple Watch and the yeah. iPhone, where they knocked off a bizarre $50. But that's it really seems weird. that when Apple offers any manner of discount, it's like a double rainbow situation where yeah. we all so just skip never and cheer and sing. Yeah. It's really, but what do you think their, their goals are with that? Is this indicative of maybe Apple Watch struggling, or are they trying to do something else? Yeah, I think the comments. I think it is. Yeah. yeah, I think the comments and um, what people are thinking is like either all right, they're they're trying to bundle and sell more iPhones, or they're trying to bundle and sell more Apple Watches. One of them's not doing too well, but their last earnings report, it seemed like everything's doing pretty fine, except they don't really give Apple Watch guidance or specific sales or anything because they they group in that other category. I. I don't know. I feel like Apple Watch isn't doing that well, though, and I think mostly it's because of the price point of the watch. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, there were a lot of reports, like, when the Apple Watch first launched that, should, that said that they didn't sell as many as they had normally projected, and so everyone was kind of wanting to see what was going to happen later, um, and now we see that it's a bundle that gives you 50 bucks off. And, I mean, like, if you get, like, the 38 millimeter like, sport model, that's going to bring it down to 300, which I think is pretty comparable to some of the other Android watches out there. But some of the other models that you really want with, like, different bands and everything, they're still going to be a significant yeah. price point. I, and so this is definitely something that I feel like people will have on their Christmas list, but they just wouldn't go buy it themselves because of the price. I think it's definitely just, this is just a market test for them. They want to mm -hmm. see, I think in the future, you're definitely going to see the iPhone, the, the Apple Watch. I think they're going to bring it down to 299 for the intro model because I think 349 is a little you're like all right, in that $300, $400 mm -hmm. range. Um, 299 so is psychologically significant. 
Yeah. 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 It definitely is. And I feel like, I mean, Apple's so proud and they're so like, um, what am I trying to say? They're so into their brand and their image. And so yeah. they can't, you can't discount something because that amount that you're going to be associated with something being on sale or cheaper or not as high end as it Somehow was before. Less worthy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they can't just discount the price, even though they probably know that they should. Um, and or they or they're just egotistical and think that we're Apple, we should be able to charge whatever we want for our Apple Watch. I think they kind of are though. Yeah, which is why the price is what it is now. But they're finding out that people don't want to pay that much for a wearable, so they're going to have to decrease the price. And I feel like whenever the Apple Watch Two comes out, it may be like you said, priced a little bit lower. I think it's going to definitely be two ninety nine because that's really palatable for people. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be interesting to see. And they should bring down some of the bands. Like, those prices are a oh, bit God. much. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. on all of them, but I don't <laughs> want to pay that price for them. <laughs> That's totally fair. So, yeah. one more thing I saw, which um, Brendan won't appreciate because he is <laughs> a Comcast evangelist. But there is a service now called a- Air Paper that will cancel your Comcast service for you, and all you have to do is pay them $5. They need your name, your account number, and five bucks and they'll do all the legwork for you. I think it's definitely worth it. I mean, you see all those like phone calls online that say, oh, it takes 15 minutes for me to cancel my Comcast subscription. And I don't know, I, I haven't had the best experience with them and their customer status. I think the, the worst in the country. It is. Yeah, <laughs> like below GM, which you know had that seat buckle issue and people yeah. died. People you know. were dying. Comcast, and is, Comcast worse. is still worse. Than <laughs> like Comcast that. is still worse because people call to have their plans canceled, and Comcast literally will not cancel it. Yeah, They'll, they may hang up on you. They may keep you on the phone for twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. Eventually, you just give up. Like yeah. this is just my you fate. I guess I'm a Comcast <laughs> person now, but. You know, I what would be really cool is if more types of these services showed up. All these little inconveniences that kind of take our time and make us frustrated. If it's just five bucks Mm -hmm. and you can renegotiate my plan or you can get rid of my service, I think I'm here for that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that a lot of people will find it convenient to be able to do this. Um, It's funny that Comcast is the one that they targeted for (laughs) (laughs) this. I personally like Comcast, obviously, but um, I wonder, like, who else are they going to use the service for? Yeah. Or I guess what are people, um, I, I want to know how many people have actually used it. I have no idea, but I really want to know what the reps are saying. Because really, I'd pay five yeah. bucks to know what they're saying so I could do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> Start your own business. Yeah. There or was... just just get rid of my stuff. Just tell me. Yeah. I'll pay you five bucks to tell me how I can cancel my service immediately. You know it's probably like some disgruntled customer that created this oh it absolutely is. or it's a former employee yeah yeah i think if you go to their website they have like one other thing that they do and it's like to get a san francisco uh like parking permit or something that that must be a nightmare then yeah i think it's like a nightmare and or you have to like have a good excuse or something but it's kind of similar there was this kid in i think it was england came out with this app that got you out of parking tickets and he would like you would just say like where you got the parking ticket he would craft this like fake email and then you just send it to them and it would like get you out of the parking ticket or something that it got taken off the app store and everything but i think yeah something like that where you these little inconveniences it probably taken down because it's basically fraud it's, it's basically <laughs> yeah it's, <laughs> i think i saw something like that though but it was like a group of attorneys that did oh, yeah. the same thing but i don't know if, if, if that same guy or or, or if maybe he just marketed it as there's a group of attorneys we're gonna get you out of your parking tickets yeah. but i mean I've gotten plenty of parking tickets at IU that that could have come in handy for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, from what I understand, um, this is not experience talking, but you do, you do get one pass. Such as, I was struggling, I was late to a meeting. You do get that one successful appeal. Yeah. And I then just, after that, you need an app. I just got one recently, though, when I dropped oh. my little cousin off to, um, I was dropping her off at the union. It was like during Welcome Week and everything, and she was going to the job fair. And you know that little booth right there? You can't drive past that if you don't have an A pass. Yeah. And they will look at your license plate and send you a ticket in the what? mail. Yeah. No. And like, oh, I even drove, wow. I like, turned right back around because I saw the lady looking at me, and I just completely spaced it because I haven't been here in like two years, yeah. two or three years. And so. I drove up to like where the, the window was at, and she didn't say anything to me, so I just kept going about my merry day. And then a couple of weeks later, there's one showing up Are in the mail. Are you serious? Yeah. That's ridiculous. I thought it was just like a, hey, if you don't have an A-pass and you park here, no, you get a we're going to come get you. Yeah, no, it's like The person a, in the gate is paying attention? Yeah. They'll look at your That's license plate, and you will get That's a too ticket. much. <laughs> that is news to me. Yeah, I got Luckily, it Luckily, I have though. an A-pass, so this hasn't been a problem, but... <laughs> 
I could use one of those. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got an appeal, though. I told her that I was just, or I told them, like, on my appeal that I was just dropping off my little cousin and, like, um, like the lady didn't stop at me or say anything to me or whatever. So they well, just and there's also no real way to turn around but to go around the gate mm-hmm. sometimes, especially when, when um, walking traffic is heavy. Yeah, and it was because it was welcome week because everyone was moving in, everyone was like going to the job fair, like it was people everywhere. And so I had no other choice but to oh, that's crazy. just kind of go past her. And I turned right back around immediately and I still got a ticket. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. You need well, a nap for that. <laughs> <laughs> consider, consider that a public service announcement. Do not drive past the gate at the IMU if you're in Bloomington without an A permit. <laughs> if we do nothing else with this podcast, we may have saved someone a ticket. I mean, Liam's the app maker. He can go ahead and make one. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get Liam expelled. <laughs> so. <laughs> so this is our last episode for 2015. Anything else to add? For this banner year. No, yeah, it's been an eventful year, I think. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, it seems that Liam may be going to CES in about three or uh, three weeks. Oh, in about thirteen weeks, probably <laughs> the Consumer Electronics Show. So we hope to have our next episode, the first one in 2016, covering that. So, dear listeners, I bring this episode of Talk Nerdy to Me to a close. If you have any feedback, questions, or want to say hi, you can reach out to us online at talknerdy.iu.edu, on Twitter at talknerdy.iu, and via email at nerdy at iu.edu. On behalf of Brendan, Liam, and Ross, this is Janae Cummings. Thank you for listening. We'll see you again in 2016. This has been an official production of the IT Communications Office, copyright 2015, the trustees of Indiana University.